Okay, good morning. Let's get started. Last week of the semester. How's everybody doing? Do you know your own name? I'm not sure if I know mine. All right, onward and upward. Okay, deep breath. We have two classes left. We're going to talk about uh, the final project uh, today. Um, we'll talk a little bit about Pyrosim for a moment. I can handle any questions about Pyrosim at the beginning of next lecture. I have my TA office hours later this afternoon, or sorry, later this morning. Uh, and then that's it until the final presentation. So if you've got any last questions, bring them uh, later this morning or to class on Thursday. Okay, let's talk about Pyrosim for a moment, and then we'll talk about uh, the final project. Uh, my apologies, my lab has developed Pyrosim. We're not Google, we don't have thousands of developers. I know the documentation uh, is not complete. We're doing the best we can. So let me try and fill in a few of the gaps for you. Um, one of the best places to look in terms of Pyrosim documentation is the last section here, simulator documentation, that has every method or every function that you can call from Pyrosim. Most of them are pretty well documented. However, the ray sensor needs a little bit more explanation. Um, as you know, like the other sensors, you can send a ray sensor to Pyrosim. And when you do, and when you get D uh, sensor data back from your ray sensor, you will get a matrix that has four columns and T rows where each row corresponds to one of the time steps from the evaluation period. Each row has four numbers in it, which is the distance of the ray at that time step, and the following three values are the red, green, and blue components of whatever the ray hit during that time step. If the ray does not hit anything, what color is returned? For those of you that have been experimenting with the ray sensor. Maybe it's black, right? You can see it actually in the visualization, it's black, and if you query the data coming back from the ray sensor, it also is zero, zero, zero. So let's switch now from the ray sensor to collecting sensor data. Okay, so uh, remember that when you get sensor data, you need to supply as an argument the ID or the name of that sensor. So if you call, for example, get sensor data and you have a ray sensor, you can see that there is this second argument, SVI, that you can supply. By default, it's zero. Most of you have probably been ignoring it, which is for the best. Um, SVI zero, if you call that, for example, not on a ray sensor, but on a touch sensor, you will get back a single vector of length t, the number of time steps in your evaluation period, because the touch sensor only re returns a single value at each time step, right? Whether the touch sensor is firing or not. Same thing with the proprioceptive sensor. It gives you back a single vector where every element in the vector tells you the angle of the joint at that time step. Most of the sensors in Pyrosim are only returning a single value per time step with the exception of the ray sensor. There are four values that are available to you. The depth at that time step, the amount of red, the amount of green, and the amount of blue, and that's where SVI comes in for, which stands for the uh, sensor vector index. I don't know if it's actually explained in there. So if you, if you collect information, if you collect data back from your ray sensor and you supply SVI equals zero, that will grab the first column out of this four by T matrix. It'll grab this first column, which contains which information? The distance, right? So what I normally do is I assign this to a variable that starts with V to remind me that it's a vector, and then D. So at this point, I know that I have all of the distance values that were obtained by, uh, that were obtained by the ray sensor. If I make my fitness function this and then take the last element out of the vector, if that's my fitness function, what do you expect to see in evolved robots that have this ray sensor on it? 
What is evolution trying to get the robot to do with its ray sensor? It's trying to get the longest. Oh, wait, no, it didn't. Look at the bluest object. Not the bluest. Uh, we've, pulled out, we've pulled out distance information. We, we haven't used any of the rest of the information. There's D, there's R, there's G, and there's B. We're just playing with distance information for a moment. pulling up the left index is looking for the thing that's farthest away. It's trying to maximize the length of that ray in the left time step. You're trying to maximize the length of the distance of the ray at the last time step. That's what this fitness function should do. Let's imagine instead that I want the robot to maximize the length of the ray sensor, ray sensor for all time steps. I can make, I can make use of NumPy's uh, vector manipulation operations. And one of the simplest ones is obviously just take the mean of a vector. So if this is my fitness function, this is now selecting for robots that manage to maximize the length of the ray sensor over this entire period. Right? Okay. So let's imagine now that I change SVI from 0 to 1. <coughs> and I go back to, I'm going to change my variable name. So I have a, I'm still pulling out a vector. I'm pulling out this vector, which is all the red information. So now I have a, re a vector of the amount of red in the ray over the evaluation period. What does this fitness function select for? Yes? Pointing at objects with higher red values. Pointing at objects that have more red in them when? When during the evaluation period should the robot do so? Only at the last time step, right? If you have, for example, a robot that's moving around in its environment and there's a red cube somewhere in the environment, what is the probability that the robot will hit that red object with the ray sensor during the last time step? Very, very small. It depends, obviously, how big the cube is and how close the red cube is to the robot. But the probability is vanishingly small. Most of the time, the ray will miss the red cube at the last time step. And if it's staring off into space or staring at the ground, the value returned by the ray sensor is 0, 0, 0 for black. So fitness is 0. If the probability is extremely low, even if you create a population of 10 robots or 100 robots or even 1,000 robots, the chance that any one of those random controllers will get something other than zero in this element of this matrix is close to zero. What does your fitness landscape look like? Remember that the fitness landscape, the horizontal dimensions, describe the different parts of the neural network. And each point in that fitness landscape corresponds to a controller. And the height of that point represents the fitness of that controller. And then you'd have a, a what we describe as a flat, sparse network? You'd have a very, landscape. you'd have a flat fitness landscape, right? Most of the points in that space, most of the random controllers are going to have a height of zero. How is evolution going to do at finding a controller that has non-zero values in here if the whole fitness landscape is flat. It's basically a random walk, right? You're probably going to have to wait a long time until something happens. So let's alter this fitness function a little bit to introduce some hills into the fitness landscape. We want to give slopes for evolution to climb. There is a Slightly better probability that a robot with a ray sensor that it's sweeping over its environment happens to hit the cube and then pass beyond the cube again. So we want to try and reward controllers that, at least for a few time steps, manage to actually hit the red object with the ray sensor. So again, we can change our fitness function and use NumPy's matrix uh, vector and matrix manipulation and now take the mean of all the red values in this vector. What does the fitness landscape look like now? It's not flat anymore. 
Wouldn't you have to color the ground black if you didn't want the robot to just stare at the ground? The color, the ground is black by default. I know it doesn't look like it in the visualization, but if you visualize a robot with ray sensors and the ray sensors hit the ground, I think the, the beams are black. So the ground is the ground is black. If it looks up in the air, it sees black. It basically kind of sees nothing. So the trick I did was to make sure there was nothing. I use blue. Okay. Thing, there's only one pure blue thing there, and I check for a one. Okay. I just do all all entries equal one and sum those up. Sure. There's different different ways we can do this. The idea here is to make sure that your fitness, your fitness function is forgiving, right? That there's, you're gonna get something other than zero even for random controllers. And even if, even if it only hits the red object for three time steps as it's sweeping the ray sensor over the environment, it's gonna get a little bit of fitness. If this controller produces a child, controller that happens to see the block for a little bit longer and then the grandchild happens to see the block for a little bit longer. You can imagine now that there is a slope in the fitness landscape that evolution can climb to find controllers that manage to keep the ray sensor focused on the red object. Right? Okay, if you have a red object in your environment and instead we change things to this. What does the fitness landscape look like now? Not very good, why not? Because there's no green option. There's no green, right? So again, this is a challenge in evolutionary robotics. Often your code doesn't crash, but there are semantic bugs in there, right? We're making the wrong assumptions about what we think the robot is doing. So I tend to be very careful about the names that I give to my variables so I know what's in there at any one time. We're pulling out sensor data and I wanna make sure that I'm pulling out red information, storing it in a vector. This is probably not gonna get, evolution's not gonna get anywhere. This I should start to see, even after a few generations of evolution, it shouldn't take long, I should start to see robots that are spending more of their time pointing their ray sensor at the red object. Question? Do you see the ray sensor passing the data onto a sensor neuron? Um, and that's on the SCI. Does it pass on the whole matrix up until that point? It, uh, it, it doesn't. When you, connect a, when you connect a sensor to a sensor neuron, yeah. you indicate which SVI yeah. is connected to the sensor neuron. So a sensor neuron always receives from a sensor receives one value, not four. Thank you, that's a, very good, that's a very good question. That's the other place you wanna use SVI. So if you create a ray sensor and connect it to a sensor neuron, you can pass along distance information or red or green or blue. You can create four sensor neurons, connect the ray sensor to all four sensor neurons and those four sensor neurons, one picks up distance, the other red, the other green, the other blue. And you now have a robot that can see in 3D, so to speak. It knows the length of the beam when it hits something. And it has color vision. It knows what the color of the object is that it's hitting. Yes? If we, use a, a, if we put an array that can only detect one color, is that only sending one column that's the distance of the blue beam? That's right. So you could, for example, place a blue object in your environment, add a ray sensor, connect the ray sensor to a sensor neuron with SVI equals 0, 1, 2, 3. So SVI 3 connected to the sensor neuron, which means now the robot can only see in blue. It can only see how much blue is in the objects that the ray sensor hits. Make sense? So it doesn't have color vision, it's just the amount of blue that it can see. Or distinguish between blue objects and everything else. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay, so let's move on uh, back to the final project. Um, it is approaching, so next uh, Tuesday morning, um, we'll be going through the final uh, projects. Unfortunately, I'm gonna be traveling. I'm gonna be Skyping in for the final project presentation, so I will be watching your presentations, but I'll be watching from in there. Um, let's talk a little bit about how this is going to go. 
Um, so if you have a look at the final project document, after the section on weekly reports, it describes the written report. The written report is due at 11.59 p.m. Uh, the night before, and there is no late extension on this, right? We're out of time because we're starting Tuesday morning. So make sure to submit your written report by 11.59 p.m., or it doesn't count towards your final grade. There's where to find uh, the submission. We're looking for a PDF document. Make sure it's PDF and not some other format. About four pages, double space, 12 point font. Grad students, it's worth 7%. Undergrads, it's worth 11%. And what we're looking for in this written document are four sections. About one page per section is, is reasonable. Um, in this report, we want you to describe what is the additional uh, functionality that you've added since your final weekly report. For the undergraduates, I want you to describe in there what you've added since last night. And for the graduate students, what you've added since last week. Okay. In addition to describing that, or as you describe that, the first page should basically be sort of the why. What was it that you were trying to test or investigate? What were you trying to evolve your robot to do? How did your deliverables move you towards that goal? So this is sort of a little bit of explanation and rationale. I was interested in this behavior or this form of an evolutionary algorithm. I thought about how to br break it down and it made sense to break it down into these parts. It turned out that X was extremely difficult, much more difficult than I thought. So I changed over to Y, but Y still helped me move towards my goal. During that process, I changed my thinking a little bit about what my final goal was. Just help us recall your, your journey since uh, assignment 10. Okay. Uh, second section, describe your implementation details. What we're not looking for in this second uh, section is just copy and paste some of your code. We're, you can put some code snippets in there, but what was your implementation strategy? So I wanted to create climbing or jumping behavior, so I had to pull out uh, information from proprioceptive and touch, and I combined it in this way. Um, so just sort of describe how you actually implemented this in code, and a few code snippets is fine here. The third section is basically results. So how are you going to demonstrate to us in this third section that you got something other than random behavior? So what we're really looking for in the final project is if your project is about climbing, not that you got a robot that climbs 100 body lengths up some stairs, but that at least you made progress towards your goal. Evolution is doing something that would be extremely rare if you just created random controllers. For some people, that's taking snapshots from a video. So here's the robot uh, performing using a random controller, and here's the robot using an evolved controller. And as long as it's clear, we can sort of see that this evolved controller is doing something that would be very improbable by chance, that's fine. Um, as I mentioned last time, you might include some fitness curves here if you're comparing <laughs> A and B, different versions uh, of your code. You might want to include a fitness, uh, uh, sorry, a footprint graph here, which we saw uh, a couple months back. Throughout this course, I've been sort of pointing out to you different visualizations that you can use to visualize what your robot is doing. So basically, use this third section to convince us that you managed to evolve something that would be very difficult to get just by through random controllers. Okay. The final section is that you thought through your final project. Obviously, you didn't have a lot of time to work on this. You're taking other courses. There are other things on your plate. What are the implications of what you did, and what have you learned from trying to evolve robots to perform some non-trivial behavior? If, for example, you had another year to work on this project, and if we opened up a UVM supercomputer to you, I gave you about 3,000 nodes on the supercomputer, what could you do? How would you extend this project? By describing how you would extend it if you had more time and more resources, you're demonstrating to us that you've sort of thought beyond what, what you were able to do in this project. Obviously, we're not looking for Nobel Prizes here, but the fact that you've been able to implement something and then you've realized sort of the challenges of evolutionary robotics and how you might 
overcome those challenges if you had more time and more resources. Any questions about that? Okay. All right. Let's talk about the oral presentation. Um, this is also, quote unquote, due at 11.59 p.m. the night before. What you're going to be submitting is a YouTube video that is exactly 2 minutes and 30 seconds long. It's not very long. We've got a lot of oral presentations to get through next Tuesday. Um, shouldn't be 2.29, shouldn't be 2.31. Make sure it's exactly 2 minutes and 30 seconds long. If everybody submits a two and a half minute video, the TA starting very early on Tuesday morning will stitch these together into a very long YouTube playlist. We will embed two 10 minute breaks in there. And at Tuesday morning at 10.30 a.m., the TA will press go on the YouTube playlist, and we won't stop it until it reaches the end. Okay, so we gotta keep to a very tight schedule. What are we looking for in that two and a half minute video? Basically, like the report, we're looking for four sections, right? What was your goal? What were you trying to accomplish? code implementation details, how did you implement your project. Section three is some results. Uh, usually, uh, usually you want that to be, in this case obviously you want to include a video of a randomly moving robot or a couple of randomly moving robots and then a short video or videos of evolved robots. And within about 10 or 15 or 20 seconds we should be able to see this is something very far from chance. If you go back and look at the examples from last year, there was the billiard ball robot where one robot knocks into a billiard ball and knocks it into a corner pocket. That is extremely improbable by chance, right? That was clearly something that was evolved. That's what we're looking for. Okay, and then the fourth section again is, given more time and resources, what would you do? Um, a lot of students will create a series of slides with bullet points. You can then sort of advance through those slides, embed your video, and move on to the other slides. How you make your video is up to you. There used to be a YouTube video editor. I don't think it exists anymore. Um, there's free video editing software for certain platforms. Please feel free to use whatever is available. We're not looking for high production quality here. If you create some slides and you advance through those slides on your laptop and you record it with your phone and then bring up some videos and play that and create a video with your phone, that's perfectly fine as long as it's two and a half minutes long. Questions? So when you said you talk over, we're, when we're here in class and when we're talking over, it's not like there's an audio where it's Exactly, exactly. So when you record it, your audio itself, your, the video itself has no audio. When we start at 10.30 in the morning, we'll write up a schedule on the board. And uh, if you're the first one to present, you come up and when we press play on the playlist, it's obviously silent and you walk us through your video. This is a challenging thing to do if you haven't done before because you don't have control over advancing and reversing your slides. You can't go back again. So practice, practice, practice. Two and a half minutes goes really, really fast. Students in the past who have taken this course were very happy to know that they were just talking for two and a half minutes and not taking a three hour exam. I promise you shorter is not necessarily easier. If you're still talking when your video ends, um, I have a very long cane that I will reach out from Reading, uh, England and pull you off the stage, or someone here will. When your video is over, you go and sit back down. The next person who can see where they are in the schedule, they will be uh, at bat. They will stand up here and be ready. When their video starts, they present, sit back down. Next person comes up, and around and around we go. Okay, if we're all here and we're all ready and we're all paying attention, this will all go very smoothly. It will be very entertaining. You'll get to see a lot of very different kinds of robots in a very short period of time. Any questions about that? Make sure when you submit your video that it's uh, public and not unlisted. So again, the TA has access to it. Make sure it's submitted by 11.59 p.m. If the TA doesn't have access to your video when he goes to stitch them into the playlist, no oral presentation. 
Any questions? No? Okay. Um, I will actually, I will put together the presentation schedule um, and I'll, I'll present it on Thursday just so you know where you are uh, in the lineup. Okay. Okay, so uh, we have three lectures left. We may or may not get to lecture 27. We'll see how we go. We're working our way through this last theme in the course on why we're talking about evolution rather than learning. Evolution tinkers with body and brain. Learning algorithms only tinker with brains. Assuming that we can create an evolutionary algorithm that gradually alters the body plan and the neural controller of the robot together, what's possible uh, beyond what would be possible if we were fixing the body of the robot and just trying to train the neural controller? We were working our way through uh, lecture 25 last time. Carl Sims's attempt to do so, this was a very impressive project at the time. Uh, over 20 years ago, and is still impressive to this day. Carl created his own physics engine, created his own evolutionary algorithm in which genotypes are encoded not as vectors or matrices or trees, they're graphs, where nodes represent how to create uh, bodies and joints, and edges represent how to alter bodies and connect them back to their parent body. It's this recursive uh, encoding that we saw last time. We saw that this was an embedded, we ended last time by seeing that these genotypes, the genomes over here, are embedded graphs. The big nodes represent how to construct the body, and the embedded nodes and edges represent how to create the brain. Every time this node is visited, or let's say this node here, every time this node is visited, it creates a fin on the left or the right side, left or the right side. These six neurons are placed inside the fin. So we have four fins, and inside each fin are these six neurons. So we have 24 neurons in the fins. Every time a main body segment is created, here and then here, this part of the neural circuitry is copied into each of those body parts. And then there is a special additional node here that contra contra contains some neural circuitry that's only placed once in the robot. And it doesn't really exist at any one location in the robot. It's the central brain of the robot. You can think of this as the central brain, and this is sort of the... Uh, the spinal cord or the peripheral nervous system, the neurons and synapses out towards the hands and feet. Okay, if we uh, if we if we call if we actually create the phenotype, there's the body. There's what the brain looks like, and you can see there's the left fin. Or sorry, there's the left fin. There's the right fin, there's the second left fin, there's the second right fin. So as we're creating these pieces, we're copying these local neural circuits throughout the robot's body, and at the top is this centralized brain. Inside each of these neurons, we're gonna place different kinds of functions. We've seen this before where we have a neural network and inside each of the neurons, we compute the raw sum that's arriving at that neuron, and then we push that raw sum through a function. That function gives us back a new value, which is the value that travels out along the outgoing synapses from that neuron. Where have we seen neural networks that have different functions in different neurons before? CPPNs, right? Compositional pattern producing networks, which we saw before can paint regular patterns over space and time. Here we see this idea uh, again. Okay. You can see there's some special functions down here called oscillate white wave and oscillate saw. These neurons are producing this regular oscillatory signal. Where have we seen that idea before? What are those neurons called? CPGs. CPGs are central pattern generators, right? We have them in our spinal cords as well. They're basically pacemaker cells. They set the pace for, in our case, walking. 
In these creatures' cases, it's walking or jumping or swimming or what have you. Can you add those in PyroSim? You can, you can add them in PyroSim. There is a special kind of neuron, which I'm probably not going to be able to find off the top of my head here. I'll have a look after class and I'll put something up on Blackboard. You can send a time series value. So you can actually create a neuron and then send a vector. And that vector will dictate the values that that neuron should output at every time step of the evaluation period. So if you create values from a sine function and you send them to that special neuron, that neuron will output that sinusoidal pattern as the robot moves. Is that different than the uh, than a function neuron, or is that a the function neuron? neuron? I think that's what it's called, right? There it is. Thank you very much. Okay, there it is. So send function neuron. I'm sorry. In this version here, you can just send a function. So if you send no function, you just send function neuron open bracket close bracket. It'll send the default one, which is the sinusoidal, and it will basically create a central pattern generator. Um, do you have some uh, suggestions for like, if you wanted to introduce a central pattern generator, yep. what, um, what wavelength you would use? What frequency, right? What frequency. It depends on what you're doing. Very non-intuitive to determine a priori what the frequency of the central pattern generator should be. So let evolution figure it out. Right? You could add an additional number to your genome, which is the wavelength or the frequency. You can create that frequency. You can send it to the function neuron here. And different robots will have a CPG with different frequencies. So evolution is searching for the right frequency of the CPG. Good question. OK. Back to Sims. OK. OK, so um, as we've seen before, uh, Sims also tried to uh, basically included mutation. So let's go back to the genome for a moment. So you can mutate the genome by selecting a random node or an edge, and then randomly altering one of the parameters associated with the selected node, or one of the parameters associated with the selected edge. Mutation's pretty straightforward. We played this game last time where you can sort of mentally simulate what will happen to the phenotype if you mutate different parts of the genotype. He also implemented crossover by taking the graph describing one parent, the graph encoded genome, the graph of the second parent and linear, linearizing them, writing them out uh, as a one-dimensional line, and then selecting, as you line up these two graphs, two different points at, chosen at random, which are crossover points, and you can then create a child genome by copying nodes and edges as you walk from left to right along the parent graph, and whenever you reach one of these crossover points, you move to parent two's graph and start copying nodes and edges from parent two. If you hit another crossover point, you travel back to parent one, continue moving to the right and copying nodes and edges. Or there's a different way of doing this. There's many different ways you could do this. We can graft part of one parent onto another to create a new child, where again, we walk along parent one and then jump across to parent and copy the rest of parent two into the child. This project was carried out long before CPPNs were invented, or NEAT, sorry, NEAT was invented. Remember that NEAT was invented to ensure that crossover tends to produce children that have about the same fitness or better than their parents. My expectation is that both of these crossover events are like cutting a PC in half and a Mac in half and gluing the two halves together and hoping that it works. Not sure, but I, I don't imagine this was very successful. However, mutation certainly works. Okay, as you saw at the end of the Carl Sims video last time, there were these two creatures that were fighting over a common uh, object. Let's look at that set of experiments for a moment. We're gonna take one robot, place it in the left of the arena, uh, creature two and place it in the right of the arena. They're going to compete over this common cube. You'll notice in this visualization that the creatures have to start behind this line and also behind this line. 
which is sloping back behind them. Why did they add this addition? Why did he add this additional detail? Why not just simply place creature one to the left of this line and creature two to the right of this line? Because they um, could grow to just be really tall and fall over. Absolutely, and you can already you can even see some of that despite this uh, this limitation. Okay, you've probably all seen some of this in your final projects now. This idea of per perverse instantiation. If you want to compete over the cube, best thing to do is be tall and very heavy and just fall on the cube. By forcing the creatures to evolve such that they start behind this sloped plane, they have to reach up and out or move forward and out in order to compete with the cube. Okay, what is the fitness or what should be the fitness of creature one? If you want to evolve these creatures to compete over the block, what's the fitness? Distance from the cube? Or, uh, Di distance from the cube. M minimize the distance to the cube. Absolutely. All right, so creature one evolves to move out and be right next to the cube, and so does creature two. So from creature one's point of view, if all it's trying to do is minimize the distance from the block, it's not really competing with creature two. Exactly. So the fitness of creature one is to maximize D2, which is the distance of creature two from the block. And the minus sign in front of D1 reminds us that it's trying to minimize this value. Since it's a distance, it's always positive. So the best it can do is minimize D1 down to zero which means the creature is on or touching object, uh, the, the cube in the center, right? And then we're gonna divide by a value to just sort of normalize this, uh, this value. The fitness of creature two is the same thing but reversed, right? Creature two is trying to maximize the distance of creature one from the block and minimize its own distance to the block. If you go back and watch the video at the beginning of this lecture, you'll see a lot of creatures that actually never touch the block at all. They reach out for creature two and try and push creature two away from the block. And by doing so, their arm is very close to the block, right? Or they reach out and pin down creature two that's trying to approach the block. Okay. So we have these two creatures that are trying to compete over the block. We have a fitness for them, but how do we combine these into a population? There's, again, different ways we can do this. Let's start with the simplest thing. We can create a population of n robots in the population, and then take robot i and compete it against robot j for all pairs in the population. Simple to do, but obviously there's a big drawback. What is it? What's the cost you're gonna pay for algorithmic simplicity here? Time complexity. Time complexity. So if you have a population of N robots, what's the time complexity here? How many, of, how many simulations do you need to run to assess the fitness for all of these robots? N squared. N squared, right? So we're gonna compete each robot against each of the n minus one robots, and we can pull out, we can pull out F1, F1 and F2 from a simulation. We don't need to compete robot one against robot two, and then compete robot two against robot one. They'll do exactly the same thing. So we can divide by two, but in terms of time complexity, that doesn't really buy us much. So the more robots we have in the population as we increase n, the number of simulations is going to grow quadratically, not ideal, right? So we could simplify things and just randomly pick a partner for each robot in the population, and we can reduce the number of evaluations down to the number of simulations down to n over 2, which greatly increases our computational efficiency, but of course it comes at a cost. What's the cost? You don't get an accurate idea of how the robot. You don't get an accurate idea of the robot, right? And so in terms of accuracy, I forgot to mention another wrinkle, which is the real fitness of robot one in a lot of these is often the average of its ability against more than one other robot. 
Okay, take the mean of the F1s that we obtain. Okay, so uh, March Madness has come and gone, but again, we could set this up as a bracket where we randomly compete robots against one another and the winner moves on to an additional competition and it gets some additional points if it wins its bracket and moves on and so forth, which is still pretty computationally efficient, but what's the problem with brackets? Absolutely, right? If you uh, mistakenly team up the best robot against the second best one and the second best one loses, you don't have a very good estimate of the fitness of the second best robot. What Sims actually did was to come up with this all versus best strategy. In the first generation, in which you know nothing about the robots, you compete every robot against every other robot. So it takes you n squared evaluations on the order of n squared evaluations in generation zero. In the next generation, you only compete all the other n minus one robots against the best robot from the previous generation. What's the advantage there? Absolutely, you get a better estimate of, of new robots because you want to see how well they do against the best robot. That's really the most important thing. If one of the new robots outcompetes the best robot, it becomes the new best robot, and the next generation you compete all n minus one robots against the new best. So it's pretty computationally efficient on the order of n simulations per generation, and we're getting a pretty good estimate of how the robots are doing. Not perfect, but pretty good. Okay, so there are different ways to do that. This was the uh, compromise that Sim settled on. We can do even better, however, if we create not just a single population, but two populations. So we have two sort of species that are competing here. And again, in this two population case, we can obviously compete each robot from population one against every robot from population two. Pretty computationally expensive. This is much more uh, computationally efficient, but again, we don't have a very good estimate. Here, in the two population case, we're, we're computing the best robot in each population and then competing against all the other robots in the other population. The reason I'm spending so much time on this slide is there are a lot of you that are doing predator-prey or, or cooperative, popula uh, cooperative robots. My suggestion, if you haven't done this already, is to create two populations, your prop population of predators, population of prey, and if you want to efficiently estimate the ability of the predator against a wide range of prey, use this best versus all in the other population approach. Works pretty well. Okay. Let's have a look at what happened in some of these co-evolving populations. So we've actually moved now in this two population case from an evolutionary algorithm to a co-evolutionary algorithm. We saw that when we talked about the virtual lions and virtual gazelles. If one population starts to do better, it's usually to the detriment of the other population and vice versa. Here's one evolutionary run here. Uh, with the black robots competing against the gray robots, so we have these two populations. What's happening? They're pretty evenly matched, more or less. There's a few points during evolutionary time when the black robots are doing a better job of approaching the objects and keeping the gray robots away from the block. And then there are other periods where it's vice versa. Well, the two populations Exactly, right? And that symmetry is deriving from the fitness that we're using, right? Which is symmetric. If, I, if I'm competing against, if I'm a black robot competing against a gray robot, if I do better, by definition, that gray robot does worse. Okay. In this, uh, in this 
separate evolutionary run here, you can see that the black robots were always doing better than the gray robots. The gray robots could never really evolve a strategy to compete with the black robots. In this case, things got so bad that eventually the fitness landscape from the point of view of the gray robots became flat. Everything they tried was a complete failure. They couldn't get any closer to the block. So this is one of the challenges about working with co-evolutionary algorithms. There's nothing in this co-evolutionary algorithm that guarantees that if one population starts to really do well, that the other population will ever be able to evolve a strategy that does any better against the superior population. This case here, again, we can see that things are pretty evenly matched and there's some interesting co-evolutionary dynamics going on in the population. Okay, that concludes our discussion about Carl Sims. Any questions before we move on? Okay, so now that we've seen a few uh, evolutionary algorithms that optimize the body and brains of the robots, why would we bother doing that? Why not simply fix the body plan of the robot, like the quadruped in the 10 assignments, and leave it at that? Use evolution or use a learning strategy to train the neural controller of the quadruped. Why allow evolution to tinker with the body as well? Because that might not be the most efficient body to achieve the desired behavior. That might not be the most efficient body to achieve the desired behavior. Exactly. It's often very difficult if there's a task we want the robot to perform to actually know what is the best body for that job. If we want a, ro a robot that helps take dishes out of the dishwasher, most people imagine something like an anthropomorphic arm and hand that can reach in and grasp the objects and pull them out uh, of the dishwasher and maybe it's on a rolling base, it can move and put the dishes in the cupboard. Is that really the best solution? Given what you now know about robotics, why might an anthropomorphic solution, an arm, a hand, fingers, not be the ideal solution for a dish, uh, a dish handling robot? Because people drop stuff all the time. People drop stuff all the time, absolutely. But not if you're careful, right? If we're coming at it from our point of view, whereas there might be something better, like we're kind of trapped in our thinking about how our bodies are. Absolutely. Thinking about thinking is misleading, and thinking about how anthropomorphic robots will think is misleading, right? This seems to work most of the time for taking dishes out of the dishwasher. Why don't we just copy the robot, the human arm, hand, finger system, and be done with it? What's the other disadvantage of this system? It's not like specialized for the task. It's not specialized for the task, right? Obviously, our ancestors out on the plains of Africa did not evolve to manipulate dishes. So there are a lot of details of this design that are not optimal for picking up thin, round, brittle objects. It's a good catch. What else? You can only do one at a time or two at a time if you do hands. Absolutely, right? So one after the other. Why does it necessarily have to be one? Can we pull multiple dishes out of the dishwasher at the same time, right? We could obviously make lots of arms and lots of hands and lots of fingers. Is there something else maybe we could do? I think it's too much to just grip one thing. Do we need five? What about four? What about three? Picking up a dish like this is maybe a little bit dangerous, but who knows, right? Well, you're also adding a lot of parameters to the, to the model when you're <coughs> increasing the number of fingers. Absolutely, absolutely. So just to, moti to motivate this a little bit more, let's have a look at an example of this. There's been work for years, decades in robotics about creating anthropomorphic arms and hands and figures. And just a few years ago, a team of researchers introduced what's known as the universal jamming gripper, which as you can see, has no fingers. Shapes, sizes, or textures can be a hard task. A robot will often find that its gripper is inadequate for handling complex objects or objects it has never encountered before. 
The reason for this is that designing an appropriate robotic hand is a hard problem for roboticists to solve. For the human hand, however, many of these tasks seem trivial. Thus, designing robotic hands inspired from human hands is a natural solution. A vast amount of work has been done in this area, and many amazing machines have been developed. But these advanced robotic hands tend to be very complicated and very expensive. Here we present a robotic gripper designed by a very different approach. Our gripper consists of one fingerless bag that can quickly and reversibly transition from a soft state, where it is easily deformed, to a hard, rigid state. The secret is the jamming phase transition of granular materials. When a granular material, like sand for example, is loosely packed, it can flow and pour like a liquid. Think of the sand flowing through an hourglass. Alternatively, when the particles are packed tightly together, they jam or lock into one another, freezing into a solid mass. So this is the idea if you've ever bought a frozen pound of coffee gr grounds. When, when a bag of granular material like sand or coffee grounds is loose and has some air inside, it's obviously very flexible. If you evacuate the air from between the granules, they will pull together and lock in place and you have a more or less solid uh, mass. I know the researchers who worked on this when they were about ready to publish this. I pleaded with them to title the paper A New Grounds for Robotic Gripping, but they didn't, didn't go for it. This is actually a latex party balloon that you see here, and it is actually filled with coffee grounds. In the prototype shown here, we are able to exploit this phenomenon using ground coffee as the granular material and a latex party balloon to contain it. We call this our universal jamming gripper. The term universal refers to the wide variety of items that our gripper can pick up. Initially, the gripper is in the soft state, and it deforms around the object it is pressed against. Then we apply a vacuum to evacuate the air from inside of the gripper and induce the rigid state. Even with this early prototype, we are able to grip many items that are especially challenging for other robot grippers. You ever try, obviously, you probably try to pick up a coin lying flat on the table, not an easy thing to do. Much easier for the universal jamming gripper, right? Thinking about thinking is misleading. Thinking about embodied behavior is also misleading. If we want to manipulate objects like plates or picking up pennies off a table, clearly this is the best way to do things, which was the reigning idea in robotics for decades. Now, in the last few years, there are a lot of versions of this. This was obviously something that was designed by human ingenuity, but the idea would be could evolution start to discover these initially non-intuitive, but in retrospect, intuitive solutions. What happens if it hits something sharp? What happens if it hits something sharp? Depends on how tough the balloon is, absolutely. Yeah, good point. What happens if your hands hit something sharp? What happens if your hands hit something sharp, exactly? My hands aren't made of coffee grounds. <laughs> <laughs> good question. Okay, so several reasons why we might want to alter the body plan is that, as was mentioned, the, the best body plan or even a good body plan for the task at hand is often not obvious. Human engineers often think past the problem. Another advantage of evolving bodies is that we can often start simple, like the universal jamming gripper, and then maybe gradually evolve up to something that's more complex. Maybe there are tasks where, where fingers and opposable thumbs are useful. Start with something simple like the universal jamming gripper and then evolve upward from there. So in lecture 26, we're going to look at uh, another one of, my, one of my experiments where I started by supplying evolution with a very simple body plan and I allowed the body to become more complex over time. And throughout that process, evolution was evolving body and brain. So, the idea here is let's start simple. Let's not create a humanoid or dog-shaped robot that has hundreds of motors and hundreds of sensors that we need to coordinate. Start simple and move up from there. And the way that we're going to approach this is we're going to include an additional detail to our evolutionary algorithm, which is an ontogenetic layer. So throughout this uh, this lecture here, we're going to see a lot of references to phylogenetic change. 
and in the middle level ontogenetic change. Phylogenetic is just another, is just a synonym for evolutionary. So obviously, if we look at our sense, uh, if we look at our ancestors, there have been a lot of phylogenetic changes in both body plan and the nervous system that led to us. Lots of phylogenetic change. But if we then look at our own lifetime, we can see a lot of changes in our own body and nervous system over our own lifetimes, how we've developed from a single cell up to our adult form. As I've mentioned before, evolution is not, evolution doesn't really encode blueprints. It includes recipes. It includes how to take material and alter and mix that material to produce something else. What evolution really does is a blueprint of development. It dictates how a single cell should divide and divide and divide again in a very particular way to produce something that's able to interact successfully with its environment. So evolution sets the developmental trajectory, the way we change or an organism or a robot changes from a simple form into a more complex form. So that now a mutation to a genotype doesn't necessarily change a trait, doesn't change blue eyes into brown. It changes the way in which eyes are made. It alters a developmental trajectory. So far, so good. If we then take, again, a snapshot at any one moment in an ontogenetic trajectory, you can ask about the very short-term sensor motor coordination that's going on at that point. Right now, I'm speaking and observing you and trying to estimate how much or how little you're understanding of what I'm saying. We can ask about the sensor motor coordination task that I'm performing right now, and we're looking at the time scale of seconds or minutes or maybe hours. If we're talking about the ontogenetic time scale, we're talking about months or years. If we're looking at the phylogenetic time scale, we're looking at thousands or millions of years. There is change occurring in any one organism, but it's change that is occurring at different time scales. Okay. So how does this relate back to the idea of evolving bodies and brains and starting simple? In the experiment you're going to see uh, here, we're going to start with a simple ontogenetic plan. There isn't a lot of things going on. It's a very simple creature that starts simple and ends simple. And then over evolutionary time, we're going to start to change that developmental trajectory. So we're no longer going from simple to simple, but simple to more complex, and then complex to complex. And I'll show you how this, how this works. OK. We're going to look, uh, as we usually do, at a locomotion task. So this isn't about manipulation and coffee grounds and party balloons. We're going to look at legged locomotion. As you all know by now, by playing around with the quadruped, locomotion is tricky in that the vast majority of the time, a robot can tip over or fall over. So if we start with a complex body, or a challenging body, if you like, a robot that has upright legs, evolution has to solve two problems at the same time. It has to get the robot from point A to point B, while at the same time keeping the robot from falling over. So evolution has to maintain balance and produce displacement in the animal or the robot at the same time. Can we simplify things so that evolution doesn't have to try and solve these two problems at the same time? Can we simplify the body to allow evolution to tackle one of these problems uh, first and then tackle the second problem. Here's the idea. So our control case is going to be what we usually see, which is an upright legged robot. And here's a whole bunch of random controllers, which aren't doing a very good job about getting the robot to move. <laughs> If, however, we evolve for a sufficiently long period of time, evolution can solve the balance and the displacement problem and eventually get the robot to move towards this light source. So this is actually phototaxis, but for our purposes, we'll just focus on the locomotion part of this. However, let's alter this a little bit so that now we're going to start with a simpler or more forgiving body where the legs are not vertical, they're horizontal. 
Here's a whole bunch of random controllers, which aren't doing much better than we saw before. But there's a little bit of promise here. Even with random controllers, there seems to be a little bit more opportunity here than there was than when we started with the robot with vertical legs. What is it? If it fails, it falls down. Um, but here we're starting it to learn how to move it and fall down already. Exactly, right? So this robot cannot fall over. Even some of these random controllers get a fair bit of displacement because evolution doesn't have to worry about balance at the same time. So by starting with a simpler body that's lying flat, we've separated for evolution the two problems of balance and displacement. So the idea here is going to be to evolve displacement first. Evolve displacement first. And once evolution has solved displacement, then we can start to change development. So now the robot is going to is going to no longer just be, or the robots are going to be no longer just robots that lie flat. Their descendants are going to start flat, but over their lifetimes, they're going to transition to increasingly vertical legs. So between this video and the previous one, we see ontogenetic change. Over the lifetime of this robot, its body is changing. It's going from lying flat to standing upright. That's ontogenetic change. We're also seeing phylogenetic change. Several, uh, several hundred generations back, the robot started lying flat. It had, this develop, it had this developmental trajectory, which is start flat and stay flat. And then over evolution, that developmental trajectory of starting flat and staying flat changed from starting flat and gradually standing up. So far, so good? OK. So let me just pause here and start to fill in a little bit more of the implementation details. At the beginning of this evolutionary run, we start with several hundred random controllers. And we try them out on the robot that's lying <laughs> flat. We keep evolving, keep evolving, until eventually one of these controllers gets the robot sufficiently close to the light source. Doesn't matter, we set some threshold, which we count as success. At that point, we pause the evolutionary algorithm and we introduce this change to ontogeny. We change the way the robot changes over its lifetime. So now, all the robot's bodies are gonna start flat and gradually become more vertical. So we now unpause evolution and continue evolution with the same population of controllers. One of the, those controllers was able to get the flat robot to the target. How well do you think that controller does when we rerun it on a robot that starts flat, but as it moves, it stands up? Good, but not as good, right? Obviously, the robot is now different. And the controller used to live in a different body, start flat, stay flat. So it's probably not going to work anymore. But it's also not probably not going to be catastrophic. Because at least during the first half of this evaluation period, the robot is mostly flat. So the controller will probably get the robot about halfway there. So far, so good? So with the start flat, stay flat robot, let's go back to our metaphor about fitness landscapes, right? We have a whole bunch of hills, and we have a controller that is sitting on the top of a hill. It's a controller that gets the flat robot to the target object. We've now altered the robot's developmental trajectory. It's going to start flat and stand up. What's happened in the fitness landscape? Do we have the same hills in the same locations? We've changed the fitness landscape a little bit. So the moment that we introduced start flat and stand up, then the, some of the hills have reduced in height and other hills have grown in height. We know that we have this controller for the start, the success, successful controller for the start flat, stay flat robot. It was sitting on the top of a hill, but that hill has dropped a little bit because the body has changed. It's possible, however, that that lowered hill has a ridge that leads to a nearby hill where it's a similar controller. We've only moved a small distance horizontally. 
in the fitness landscape. Slightly different controller, but now that controller gets the robot that starts flat and stands up to the target object. So it doesn't take a lot of generations to evolve from the successful controller for the flat robot to get to a controller that's successful for this slightly different robot. So far, so good? OK, so we've now, we're going to pause evolution for a second time because now we've hit success again in the start flat, stand upright robot. We're now going to unpause evolution and continue it for a third phase. What do you think we're going to do in the third phase? In phase one, we had start flat, stay flat. In phase two, we had start flat, stand up. What do you think we're going to do in phase three? Stand up the whole time. Stand up the whole time. We could. We're going to be a little bit more gradual. We're going to tell the robot, start flat and get to upright in the first half of your lifetime, and then maintain that during the rest of your lifetime. So it's a little quicker at standing up. Doesn't quite get to the block, but close enough. That's phase three. And then as mentioned in phase four, start upright and stay upright. It's kind of cheating a little bit, right? OK. So now we have two evolutionary algorithms. We have the usual thing down here, where we fix the body. If we go back to the cartoon for a moment. The standard way of doing things now is evolve evolutionary change and compute fitness on how the robot locomotes or grasps objects. Our new, more expanded evolutionary algorithm, as evolutionary change is occurring, we are also making changes to how the robot's body changes over its own lifetime. So this new expanded algorithm contains phylogenetic change, ontogenetic change, and the normal sensor motor change in joint angles and so on. So when you were testing scaffolding versus no scaffolding, um, is it, or for both of those processes, is it the same number of generations? Or uh, are you just showing that one is better than the other? Or good, is it like an efficiency of learning type of thing? Good question. It's the latter. It's an efficient, how efficient is evolution? So I haven't told you how many total generations it took to get, at the end of this algorithm, an upright quadruped to the light source. Nor have I told you how many generations it takes to finally get this upright quadruped to the target object. You can probably guess from all this lead up that it actually takes less generations in total to get to find a successful controller for the upright quadruped when we introduce this ontogenetic change than when we don't. Right? As you mentioned, this, the term scaffolding is in here. We've seen scaffolding before. This idea of making the learner's environment simpler so that they can learn the rudiments of a task. And then we, we remove the training wheels, and it should be able to improve upon the rudiments of that task. In everything we've seen up to this point, scaffolding has been external. Place the target object right up next to the robot and then move it away. We've made changes to the robot's environment to make things easier, like putting training wheels on a bicycle. Here, this is morphological scaffolding. The robot's own body is the scaffold. This is a new idea in robotics, but as always, it's not a new idea to Mother Nature. She's discovered this many times in many different species, including us. One of our unique abilities is to be able to move on two legs and not fall down. Difficult thing to do. We don't start being born tackling the problem of bipedal locomotion. We start close to the ground, figure out how to displace, and then very gradually figure out how to free up these things and just use these two things to get us from point A to point B. Okay. As I mentioned, we've seen this idea of scaffolding many times 
uh, before. In this case, we're going to look at morphological scaffolding. So we have five minutes left. I'm going to just start to describe different versions of this algorithm, and we're going to compare how well this idea of morphological scaffolding does. As we go, we're going to use a bunch of adjectives here, so just to uh, keep in mind what they are. We have phylogenetic change, which means over evolutionary time, and ontogenetic change. In, in this top row here, we have the standard experiment, evolved neural controllers for an upright, uh, an upright quadruped. Then the experiment that you just saw, which is we're going to increase in, uh, sorry, this is slightly different. In this experiment, we're going to introduce phylogenetic change. So over evolutionary time, we're going to start with the robot lying flat and end our evolutionary time with the robot that's standing upright. But there's going to be no ontogenetic change. If you look at these little inset uh, axes, these inset axes are representing the height of the center of mass of the robot over its individual lifetime. So this horizontal arrow here is our evolutionary time, number of generations. The inset axis is t equals 0 in PyroSim and t equals 1,000 in PyroSim. It's the evaluation of one robot. In this robot, there's no ontogenic change. This robot stays flat. Uh, starts flat and stays flat. This robot starts with legs angled 30 degrees down and ends with legs 30 degrees down. Then we move on to a robot with 60 degrees and then finally 90 degrees. The third experiment shown in the third row corresponds to the videos that you just saw. We have phylogenetic change. The robot's body and brain is changing over evolutionary time. And we have ontogenetic change. Start flat and end flat. Start flat and get to upright. Uh, sorry, start flat and end upright. Start flat and get to upright during the first two thirds of your lifetime. Start flat and stand upright during the first third of your lifetime. And then finally, start upright and end upright. So far, so good. I've introduced this additional term here, parametric change. The parameter that I'm describing here is the angle of the legs relative to the body. So 0, 30 degrees, 60 degrees, and 90 degrees. Okay. There's one more change we can introduce, which is topological change. In this case, we're not going to go from a robot with flat legs to upright legs. We're going to go from a robot that has no legs to a robot that grows legs. So we'll end today by just looking at a few videos of this. This is a hexapod now, not a quadruped, but same idea. This robot grows increasingly long legs that become increasingly vertical over its lifetime. Okay, you're all experts in pyrosim now. You cannot change the length of a cylinder during a pyrosim evaluation. So how is this possible? There's a little bit of pyrosim black magic going on here. The linear slide and the leg hidden inside the body part. The leg is hidden inside the body. My students call this the trombone trick. So you have the body hidden inside. You have the leg hidden inside the body, the fully uh, elongated cylinder. It's attached inside the body with a linear piston. And the piston pushes that leg out the side of the body. The piston is attached to the body segment with a normal rotational hinge joint. So the leg is extended out and becomes increasingly vertical over its lifetime. I think this is a good place to stop for today. You have a quiz due tonight, and I will see you for last class on Thursday.